Good morning. So someone dared use the S word with me this morning. Apparently there's little flakes of S falling down from the sky. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's snow. Uh, we were hoping that was gone for uh, this year, but maybe not. And uh, hey, as I've been told when I was young, if you don't like the weather, wait 10 minutes. <laughs> It'll probably change. Hey, folks, we have, as you know, two uh, in particular outreach ministries here at Christian Baptist Church that we participate in, um, and many people are involved in it in different ways. Um, so the one is our porch pantry. The porch pantry is uh, the ability for us to be able to put food in a locker that sits at the annex, the building just beside us. Um, and we put dried goods primarily in there and canned goods. The, uh, the benefit of that for the community is that they can come, people who are in need, people who are hungry, and they can come and take uh, at their time, any time of the day. We try to keep that stocked at least once uh, a day, uh, filled up completely, sometimes more. Uh, but we try to do that at least that time. The costs of doing that are not small. Uh, our budget for that is approximately 600, if I'm correct, a month um, dollars in our, that's right, so $600 a month that we give in that. But one of the other ways that people uh, support that ministry is uh, people bring canned goods and whatnot to the church and we can put them in there. So here's a real practical way for you to do that on Sundays. Uh, you can bring canned goods, some dried goods, some um, pasta, uh, things like that. And you can bring them downstairs. We have a table downstairs that's labeled for the food pantry. And if you'd like to do that, we would love you to participate in that ministry with us. Uh, it's a great way to be able to touch and, and uh, build into the lives of the community and to build a relationship of trust with them uh, so that we might hopefully proclaim the word of God to them and see some of them saved. So that's one way, one of those ministries. The other ministry, which many of you are uh, aware of and participate in, is our weekly barbecue that we have on Wednesdays. And what an amazing uh, ministry that has been, as we've been able to connect with people in our community and proclaim the name of Jesus to them. We make no apologies for what we do. We feed food. Uh, we give them a hamburger. We give them a hot dog. Uh, sometimes some beautiful homemade soup or a stew. Uh, and it is a terrific opportunity to connect with people who are in need or who just want a friend uh, here in the community. And we're able to build relationships with them. But make no mistake, we don't feed them food just for the sake of feeding food. We feed them physical food because our desire is to do what's more and that is to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to them for spiritual food. And each week as you help support that ministry through your prayers, and trust me, we need your prayers uh, each week as we do that. Um, but as we do that together, we will see people come to know Jesus as their Savior. Uh, it's amazing the spiritual conversations that our team uh, are beginning to have with some of our guests uh, some of our guests are now trusting us and asking us to pray for them. Uh, and it's a, a real privilege for us to be able to do that. So we meet the physical need because their hearts are open when they know we care about their physical need. Uh, and it allows us to then proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. And we thank you for being part of that ministry uh, with us each week. Uh, we could not do it alone. You may think, well, you know, I haven't gone and done that, and I haven't participated in that way. But you do in many other ways here and around the church. And even your tithes and your offerings support those and undergird those ministries. And we appreciate that so much. As we begin our time together, let's worship in prayer. Father, this is Good Friday. What a confusing name for a day when you gave your son, Jesus, to suffer and bleed and die on a cruel cross for our sin. 
And Father, we know that we are sinners. It's not lost on us. But Lord, sometimes we think that we're okay in ourselves and of ourselves. But today we want to acknowledge the reality of the fact that not only are we sinners, you are a good God who's provided a sacrifice to pay the price for our sins, and that was Jesus. And so we come to you today in Jesus' name, admitting that we're weak, admitting that we are not strong, admitting that we don't have it all together, but that he does. And that because of him, we can be raised to life just as he was. So Lord, in our songs today, in our hearing of your word, in our remembrance around the communion table, in all of these things, Lord, we ask that you would be glorified because that's our desire in our heart, that we would lift you up high. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to stand as we sing together. Someday for us 
cross I bow my knee Where your blood was shed for me There's no greater love than this You have overcome the grave Your glory fills the highest place What can separate me? Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, starting at verse 27. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the porcelain and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. And they stripped him and they put a scarlet robe on him. And then they twisted together a crown of thorns and they placed it on his head. They put a staff in his hand and they knelt in front of him and they mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews! And then they spit on him. And they took the staff that was in his hand and they struck him on the head again and again. And after they had mocked him, they took off the robe and they put on his own clothes. Then they led him away to be crucified. And as they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry his cross. They came to a place and a hill called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And they offered Jesus wine mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided up his, crow, his clothes and cast lots for them. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. And above his head was placed a sign with the written charge against him. And it read, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Two robbers were crucified with him. One on his right, the other on his left. And those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, 
you who are going to destroy the temple and build it up in three days. You can't even save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. And he's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and then we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. We'll let God rescue him now if he wants, if he wants to. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the robbers on the left and the right mocked him as he was crucified and they heaped insults upon him. Good Friday? Good? Can you see the irony here? The fact that we refer to the events of that Friday as good? It seems strange. From the perspective of all who were present during those 24 hours of the first Good Friday, it was horrific and scandalous. From the most sincere disciple to the most casual spectator, the events of that day, the events that took place in their presence before their eyes, was anything but good. I mean, think about it. The political leaders of the day examined Jesus. They questioned him. They questioned the charges that were raised against him. Then after doing that, they concluded that he was an innocent man. In fact, Jesus wasn't only pronounced innocent once. Not only was he pronounced innocent twice, but three times he was found innocent by those who could render such a verdict. And even after Pilate declared that Jesus was innocent, the crowd, having been whipped into a frenzy by the religious rulers, would not allow the verdict to stand. And they demanded that Jesus be put to death. Fridays before, Jewish religious holidays were actually not good days. They were bad days. In fact, it was the time when the Romans wanted to make a spectacle of the Jews. So if there was a Roman, or sorry, a Jewish problem, that was the day they were going to crucify someone. Now, the truth is, they had a little bit more respect with the revolting power of the Jewish people. So they did the crucifixions the day before the religious holiday. Like in this case, the day before the Passover. And even though the Romans didn't like the Jews, they respected them enough to allow the Sabbath and other religious activities to continue and take place. Activities like the Passover. And they observed them with guarded peace. However, the day before this holiday Passover was a day for public execution. Executions would be held, as I said, on the Friday so that those who were being executed could be removed from the cross and tidied up before the Jewish Sabbath began. The Passover would not be treated with too much disrespect on behalf of the Romans. Isn't it ironic that we today wake up on Monday mornings and long for Fridays? But on the week for the Jews of a religious holiday, they would wake up on Monday mornings and dread the coming Friday. The Romans had already prepared for the day without Jesus. There were three condemned criminals already. Two thieves whose names we don't know. And then one murderous insurrectionist given a name. The name is Barabbas. Three crosses had already been prepared and were waiting for the occupants to be nailed in place. Three people were being held in a first century version of death row. Three trials had already been held. Three sentences 
had already been pronounced. Three men were waiting to die. Three guilty men. But not everything was as it seemed. One of those guilty men on death row was going to get an unexpected pardon. One innocent man, a good man, a kind and compassionate man, a healer, a miracle worker, some call the prophet, one who loved the people, was going to suffer and die in his place. Historians and, archae and archaeologists suggest that those who were sentenced to die would have been brought up to a holding cell in a place that would be public for everybody to see so that they could mock them as they went by, usually 24 to 48 hours before the crucifixion. So imagine the crowds having walked by the three, having mocked them, jeered at them, perhaps even spat on them. However, on this particular day of execution, things would not go as normal. Things did not go as normal. Things were never planned to go as normal, according to God's plan. You see, there was an interruption in the normal flow of activities, the crowds being led by their religious leaders in front of Pilate. They were demanding that Jesus be put to death also. The problem was, the political rulers struggled to grant their request because they couldn't find anything that Jesus was worthy of dying for. Everything was on hold because of one million dollar question. What do we do with Jesus? Perhaps that's the million-dollar question for us today, too. What do we do with Jesus? Imagine what it would have been like for the two thieves and Barabbas in the holding area. They knew what was coming for them. The last thing they wanted to do was to wait this day out. They wanted to get it over with. They knew the torture that they were going to go through. Nothing good was going to come of that day. They knew their destiny. They probably wondered why there was some kind of delay. You know it's going to be a really bad day when you just want to get over thing, everything over with. But everything was being held up because of the demand that an innocent person be put to death. One of the customs of the day was that they would release a prisoner and that his sentence would be commuted if the people agreed to it and called for it. That was how the Romans appeased the Jews. It was actually a gift from the Romans. That person would take the place, would be relieved, and would be set free. Passover celebration was the typical time that that was done. And Pilate, hoping that the people would ask for Jesus to be released gave them a choice. And he said, do you want Barabbas, the worst of sinners, or Jesus, a man found to be without fault? Pilate chose Barabbas, likely because he assumed that the Jewish people would love to have Barabbas freed. Or sorry, to, that no one would let Barabbas free, that they would love to instead have Jesus freed. But his conscience was likely burning at the thought of murdering an innocent man like Jesus. So here Pilate brings before the audience, before the crowds of people, Barabbas. He doesn't bring the thieves. He brings the murderer, the insurrectionist. He was hated by the people. There was no way the people would let him go free. Can you imagine the scene? Barabbas is holding in a cell. Suddenly he hears the crowds chanting his name. Barabbas! Barabbas! He doesn't know why they're chanting his name. He just knows that he can hear their name, his name being chanted. 
He doesn't have a clue as to why it's happening and why they're choosing him, a hardened criminal. criminal. But he's going to be set free. But the crowd goes silent. See, Barabbas doesn't know that yet. Pilate begins to ask the crowd what he should do with Jesus. Then the crowd shouts out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Could you imagine what must have been going through Barabbas' head when all he hears is his name being called out? And then the yells and the screams of the people to be crucified. He knows his fate, but he didn't expect that the crowds would cheer for his execution. Then he hears the footsteps, and he knows the time has come. And he sees the guards walking up the pathway to the holding cell. He knows that in a matter of minutes, the nails will be driven through his hands and through his feet. But that didn't happen. The first thief is taken out. Then the second thief. And then a guard comes for Barabbas, expecting the pain that's about to follow. But instead, he loosens the shackles that are around his feet. He takes off the chains that bind his hands. And he says to him, go fast before we change your mind. You're free. My name is Barabbas. I'm the man that was found guilty. I'm the one condemned to death. Because I am the sinner and the murderer and the blasphemer and the adulterer and the one who took God's name in vain. Yes, I am the one who broke every command that God ever gave. It's me. Well, sure, your search committee, when they came and hired me, didn't look at my identification. Otherwise, they probably would have seen somewhere written in fine print, his real name is Barabbas. But that's who I am. I was the one whose wages needed to be paid for by the blood of an innocent man. I was the one condemned to die. And yet, I was the one set free because an innocent man named Jesus took my place. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love towards us that in while we were still sinners, while we were still Barabbas, Jesus died for me. Somebody was going to die that day. Barabbas deserved it. Jesus did not. Barabbas could not have stopped the proceedings. Jesus could have. At any point in time, Jesus could have called down 10,000 angels, perhaps 10,000 times 10,000, to defend him, to lift him, to relieve the agony he was about to go through. At any point, Jesus could have simply spoken a word and his enemies would have been vanquished. At any point in time, Jesus could have stopped it all, but he did not do it. Jesus willingly paid the price for my sin to set me free. Two people were in front of Pilate. Pilate had to release one of them. There were only three crosses that day. The one was a sinner against God and man, a criminal stained with insurrection and murder. The other one was a holy, faultless Lamb of God. Pilate condemns the innocent and acquits the guilty. And he orders Barabbas to be set free. 
and sentences Jesus to death on the cross. What a substitution. What a savior. This is the exchange that takes place between Jesus and you when you put your faith in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For God made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Well, what does that mean, Andrew? I've heard that verse before, but it doesn't make sense to me. How could God make his own son sin? Well, he did it like this. God the Father treated Jesus, the pure, holy, blameless Son of God, as though he had committed every sin that had ever been met by any person at any time that anyone could have conceived of, and he threw that upon his own blameless Son, his pure and holy Son. And he considered him to be sin. And although the fact is that he'd never become, had he never committed any sin at all, he took upon my sin and yours. Hanging on the very cross that Jesus was crucified on was this man, Jesus, holy, helpless, and pure. Hanging on the cross, he was the perfect, the only acceptable sacrifice. He was the spotless Lamb of God. Never for a single second a sinner. He was holy God on the cross. However, God the Father treated his only son as though he had lived my life. That every sin that I had committed, he gave to his son. And God punished Jesus for my sin. And then he turns completely around and he treats me as though I had lived the blameless life of Jesus. He paid the price for my sin as my substitute on the cross. And this is the heart of the gospel. In Christ Jesus, we are offered complete and full forgiveness. In Jesus, we can be covered, not just covered, but washed in the blood of the Lamb. Our only righteousness is the righteousness of Jesus. We have no righteousness of our own. And when God looks at the cross, he sees you. And when he sees you, he sees Jesus, his beloved son. If you've been saved by Jesus, then Barabbas is more than a name of a man back then. You and I are Barabbas. You were guilty. You were condemned. You were helpless. And yes, you should have been on that cross. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, our death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Jesus died in our place. Jesus took our guilt. Jesus took our shame. Yes, Jesus was condemned for us so that we could be forgiven. So that we could have life. Jesus died on the cruel cross so we, the guilty, might be set free. And that's why it's called good. Friday. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three 23 and 25 says this. The Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after dinner, he took the cup and he said, this cup of the new covenant is my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. We're invited to a table. 
tables in front of us set for communion. I often worry that sometimes the table set before becomes too routine, becomes too, we've done it before a hundred times. We forget the importance of what Christ has done for us. But today I will invite you, Dan, if you wouldn't mind coming forward. We're going to invite you to come and to take the bread and to take the cup. I would ask that you'd take it back to your seat and wait, and we'll take it all together, appropriately together. But as you do, I would like you to consider the words of the song that will be playing and the words will be on the screen. But I also want you to consider this. Your name is Barabbas. Your name is Barabbas. And Jesus paid your debt so that you could be set free. And today we celebrate being set free and we remember the sacrifice, his body and his blood. No. 
Jesus himself that invites us to the table today. When we come to this table, we come to express our gratitude, our thanks for us, Barabbases. We come to remember and to proclaim the love of Jesus displayed for us through his literal bodily death on a cross until he comes. We have two elements. We have the bread and we have the cup. Listen again to the story of the bread, not in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament. In Isaiah chapter 53, verses 3 to 5, it says, He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hid their faces, he was despised. And we held him with low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and he bore our suffering. Yet he considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. And he was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed for our sins. And the punishment that brings us peace was placed upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Look back at the stripes. Look back at the wounds that Jesus suffered so willingly on our behalf because we were helpless in our own bodies to bear such a burden of death. This is not about a loaf of bread or a cracker. It's about Jesus and what he's done for us to give us freedom, something that we could not do ourselves. And Jesus is saying to you today, this bread is my life for you. It's my body for your body. Remember me. Take and eat. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the cross that you were nailed to. Thank you that your body was sacrificed for mine. For I could not bear the penalty of my own sin. But you, Lord Jesus, willingly gave of yourself because of your great love for us. Love so amazing, so divine. So we thank you that your body was broken for us so that we could be healed spiritually and physically in Jesus. Amen. Not only was Jesus' body bruised, not only was it cut, not only was it broken, but his precious blood was spilled. And it was spilled to write for us a new covenant between you and God. His blood was shed and spilled to wash us, not just to cover us, to make us pure. Many of us wish only we could go back to a little bit of purity in our lives. But what Jesus has done has made you white as snow. And when the Father looks on you because of the shed blood of Jesus, 
You're blameless if you belong to him. Make no mistake, it is a lie to say that we are all children of God. If that's the case, the lost sinner who's never repented, never turned their heart to God, could be a child that's not true. We become children of God through belief, through faith, through repentance, and through receiving the body and blood of Jesus for us, the new covenant, so that we could have our sins forgiven. Hebrews 9 verse 12 is a powerful verse. And it says the truth of Leviticus that says that there is life in the blood. But in Hebrews 12, it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Remember back to the Old Testament when the high priest was required to offer blood. But he didn't do it just for the sins of the people. He did it for himself daily. But no, not Jesus. Jesus was our high priest, the spotless Lamb of God. When he offered his own body and his own blood for us, it was once for all. Have you ever noticed the irony of this? The entire Jewish system changed because of the cross. There is no more sacrifice in Israel. Did you catch that? There is no more sacrifice in Israel. And why is that? Because the lamb was enough to wash us clean. Jesus is our mediator. He was the sinless sacrifice for our sin. The blood that was shed on the cross was for your sins and for my sins. No matter how far you may feel like you've fallen from God, no matter what your past has been, I have such great news for you. In Jesus, you are set free. His blood takes away our sins. His blood washes us pure. And in him, we are free. Today we're invited to this table to remember the body and the blood that we commemorate with a glass of juice. And Jesus says to us, as often as you do it, as often as you drink it, remember me. Let's drink together. And let's pray. Thank you for the blood, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for what you've done for me on the cross. Thank you for the forgiveness that I can receive because of your goodness towards a sinner like me. Lord, we come on a day we call Good Friday. And it confuses us. So much has taken place in this last week. You were cheered at by the crowds on Sunday when they said, Hosanna, he's here to save us. And we, the same people, only a few days later cried out, crucify him. Crucify him. But because of the great love of God, that has been lavished upon us, demonstrated in the person and work of Jesus, our Savior. We are not only forgiven, but we are set free. And that is why it's good. When you created the heavens and the earth, when you created everything that was in it, when you set the light apart from the darkness, when you created animals to walk free on the earth, when you gave boundaries to the earth and the water, all of these things you said were good. 
but when you created us, you said very good. And I think the reason you said very good, God, is because you knew what you would do to pay the price for our sin. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Lord, we look forward to what's coming. We look forward to the fact that you did not stay dead in the grave, paying the price for our sin, but you rose up from the grave, giving us direction and hope, giving us victory over death, giving us victory over our sin, giving us vict victory over our chains. You broke the chains. And oh, we look forward to resurrection Sunday. And we do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, I'm so glad you came and joined us here for Good Friday. Perhaps it wasn't a traditional Good Friday service that you may be used to. Well, that's okay. I'm not very good with traditions. But I have great news for you. Jesus didn't just die and remain in the grave. So join with us on Sunday, would you? So that we can celebrate the resurrection of Jesus together. We might sing together of the hope that we have in the risen Savior. Listen, the world out there needs Jesus. And that's why you're here today. Not to sit there and hoard it to yourself. It's so that you can go out there to proclaim the good news of Jesus, right? So I challenge you. If all you want to do is come back next Sunday and just do church together, don't bother. Don't come. Just go somewhere else. Have bacon and eggs with somebody. But if you want to come back here and celebrate the God who sent you free, then oh, would you come back and join us as we worship our risen King. God bless you, church. Hope to see you on Sunday.